we'll um, have a look at. Okay, so uh, we're going to be looking, start to looking on slightly shorter timescales um, for, for, this, for this lecture. That wasn't supposed to be blank. Um, oh, there we go. So the, uh, and when we do that, uh, we're going to be thinking about this equation here. So this is an important equation that you should know. Um, uh, so we'll be looking at changes in uh, the solar flux, or the amount of energy that's received by the Earth from the Sun, the reflectivity of the planet, and the um, emissivity of the atmosphere. Okay, so the bit we're going to start to zoom in on is this, this bit of Earth's history that's basically the last, kind of, uh, since the last period when the, the Earth was very, very warm, kind of cooling down to the, the, the present. And this is a little zoom in of that. So, again, we're looking at oxygen isotopes as our proxy for global climate state. So, uh, warmer uh, conditions and less ice on the continents corresponds to more negative delta 18O, so lighter oxygen isotopes. So, these are recorded in marine um, sediments. And we can see, uh, so I guess the Cretaceous is just off, so the KT boundary is, is just here. And we're basically looking through, um, uh, the, the, uh, I guess, the um, recent uh, climate history from the last 65 million years here. And you can see that it was warmer about 50 million years ago and has been gradually cooling ever since. Um, and that corresponds to a fall in sea level, okay, over this time. So from kind of maybe almost 200 meters higher than present to, to I guess, down to 120 meters below present uh, 20,000 years ago. Um, uh, and the other thing to note is this, this the, uh, the, the change has not been a nice smooth change. There's been lots of uh, jumps and kind of wiggles and starts across that. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, but first of all, the long-term trend um, is largely due down to this change in the rates of global volcanism over time. And we can, we can get estimates of this from uh, seafloor spreading chronologies. So if you've done Earth Dynamics, you might know about these. But basically, we can date how old the Mid-Ocean Ridge is um, at different points away from its center uh, using magnetic stratigraphy. Uh, and if we know how old it is and how far apart it is from the middle, we can work out the spreading rate. Um, so we can produce records of how much volcanism there's been through time. So about 60 million years ago, the rates of volcanism were a little bit higher than present. And that can explain quite a lot of this change in temperature through a um, change in the emissivity of the atmosphere. So more volcanism, more CO2 in the atmosphere over the long term. Uh, and a reduction in temperatures. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these little wiggles now. So the, the, the planet has not been kind of in a fixed kind of orientation in terms of its continents through all of that 65 million years. Stuff has happened. Uh, so one of the big things that's happened is that this is India, and here's, India has collided with the rest of Asia, and that happened uh, around um, 20 million years ago. Uh, and that collision formed a high mountain belt, okay, uh, called the Himalayas, which you may be familiar with um, from the telly. I'm not expecting you all to have gone on there on your gap yard. Um, but uh, this is important because this is a large mountain belt. There's a lot of erosion going on. And it's also uh, quite near the tropics. Okay, it's not really in the tropics at the moment, but it's near there. So there's a lot of rainfall in this region. So it's, it's hot, it's wet. Uh, and there's a lot of physical erosion. And all of those things will act to increase the rate of chemical weathering, okay? Because you increase the precipitation, you increase the, um, uh, the amount of water, it's hot, so you've got lots of temperature, but you also uh, are grinding the rock up into lots of little pieces that increases the surface area, so you have an increase in weathering. Um, so that will act as a cooling, and you can kind of, okay, you kind of see this, maybe there's some, kind of cooling events on here, which might be well, these accelerations in, in, in rates of change of temperature might be related to uh, some of these changes in weathering through time. Another way that we can think about changing the global climate is, is the changing the, the, the distribution of heat around the planet. So um, as the continents have been kind of drifting apart here, um, at some point, uh, I think 25 to 20 million years ago, it says up here, um, this gap here in between Antarctica and um, South America, that opened up. So before that time, that those, those continents were still um, being best friends and holding hands. Um, and that meant that there was no passage for water to get through. Okay? So uh, 
now there is a, a gap, water can get through, and now a, a very strong current can form, uh, basically flowing around um, Antarctica. And if that current wasn't there, water would, would maybe flow down from, from lower latitudes and then join up like that. Or uh, Basically, this current that can now flow around Antarctica, you can see in terms of the heat flux from the ocean, you can see that this region of the ocean is very cold compared to maybe 60, 50 degrees, look at 60, 50 degrees, compared to the northern hemisphere, uh, it's a lot colder at that latitude. And this is because this current going round and round and round, it's basically just isolating that bit of the Earth from the rest of the climate system. Okay? So by, by this current just going round and round and round and round, it's very hard for heat, at least ocean transport of heat, to get down into this, this region down here. And that means that that, that that current going around Antarctica is effectively cooling that region because it's not allowing heat to get there from the tropics. Um, so this is the uh, uh, kind of a, uh, I've shown this before, kind of a cross-section of uh, temperature from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. And you can see uh, in the mid-Cretaceous, so this was before, like 60-something million years ago, um, the, uh, the distribute, well, first of all, it was hotter on average, and also the, the temperature of the poles was a lot warmer than um, at present. And it's kind of symmetrical. Okay? And this is because heat is being really effectively moved from the, the equator to the poles. Now, if you look at the present day, it's a little bit cooler, uh, and that might explain some of the reason why the, the heat transport to the poles is a little bit less efficient. Uh, but you can see that there's this imbalance. So the, the southern hemisphere, there's the heat transport to the southern hemisphere is less efficient than in the northern hemisphere. That leads to the southern hemisphere and Antarctica in particular becoming very, very cold. And it's a continent, it's on the pole, so we're, we're able to build up an ice sheet there because it's, you know, <coughs> it's super cold. Okay, so uh, perhaps the opening up of that gateway, this ocean gateway at the Drake's Passage, that led to a global cooling, okay, because we isolated Antarctica, we therefore allowed it to glaciate, get cold enough to glaciate, and then... That, that glaciation led to some positive feedbacks in terms of an albedo feedback allowing like, more solar radiation to be reflected at space, so therefore cooling the whole planet. Um, you have other gateways uh, that have opened and or closed uh, around uh, in between continents, and these have quite, can have quite different effects on, on the climate. So another one here, this is uh, the Isthmus of Panama uh, here, and uh, I think... 10, yeah, 10 something million years ago, that was open, okay? So water could go from the uh, Atlantic into the Pacific, okay? Um, and since, uh, since that time, some, some volcanoes have built up and we've got some kind of land now, which is uh, nice if you kind of, you know, live there. Uh, but what that's, the effect of that on the ocean circulation is that the warm water from the Atlantic, okay, it's so all this lovely warm water that's been building up in the, in, the, in the tropics that's causing lots of hurricanes at the moment, that, that used to be able to make its way into the Pacific, okay, and, you know, that heat would then go into the Pacific Ocean. But since that's been kind of like uh, cut off, then we get a, quite a strong current of water kind of um, moving up this side of the, uh, the eastern side, that is, of uh, uh, the United States, um, so there would have probably been a current there in the past. So this is the Gulf Stream you may have heard of. Um, but by shutting off this, this gateway, it's basically stopped some of that, that warm water leaking out into the Pacific. So this will have intensified the Gulf Stream and the, the North Atlantic Drift. And the, the, this current is quite important for a region like Greenland because it transports a lot of heat to that region. So if we cut off this, uh, if we cut off this passageway here, we go right... We're going to put a blockage there. That's going to mean this region up here is going to get warmer because the heat's going to be transported up that Gulf Stream. Now, the thing is, that causes the ice sheet to grow, okay, that extra warmth. Because ice sheets don't just need it to be cold, they also need it to snow. Okay, so if it's cold enough already, okay, uh, you might not have an ice sheet on Greenland because there's not enough snow in the winter for an ice sheet to build up. But if you start increasing the, the strength of this, this um, what do you call it, current in the ocean, um, that will transport heat and 
Also, that heat energy will mean that the atmosphere will warm and become more kind of evaporative. The evaporative atmosphere? No. The ocean will evaporate more into the atmosphere, and it will rain more. Okay? It's why we get lots of rain in Scotland, uh, and we'd also get more rain and, uh, more importantly, snow over Greenland and Iceland. So it's the transport of moisture that is promoted by this increased um, current here, which might cause glaciation in Greenland, okay, because of this gateway shutting. Um, so we can, we're zooming in now on basically the last 5 million years, so up in here, and we can see that we, uh, uh, we're still cooling down, and we sort of increase the rate of cooling down uh, at this point here, around uh, three, 3 or 4 million years ago. Um, and it's thought this is when Greenland kind of started to become glaciated. Okay, and we think that's due to the, um, uh, uh, basically the, the shutting off of the, this gateway in the, in the um, Caribbean, uh, which uh, led to changes in ocean circulation. Um, so that might explain some of these long-term trends. Okay, so we've got this long-term cooling because maybe we're reducing the amount of volcanism globally, so we're, 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 we're um, removing CO2, we're, we're basically putting less CO2 in the atmosphere. We might have uh, changes in rates of this cooling due to uh, changes in weathering. Uh, uh, and we also might have uh, changes in ocean gateways, which are kind of blocking off ocean currents or allowing ocean currents to develop, which kind of redistribute heat around the planet, which might promote glaciation in some places. Now, the kind of thing that's really staring us in the face with this, uh, this plot is not really these long-term trends of, oh, it's a bit warmer here and then gradually cooling down here. It's this wiggling up and down, okay? You can see that there is a long-term trend of cooling, but there's a lot of variability on a much higher frequency in these plots, okay? Um, so that's what we're going to try and explain now. Um, so we're going to move on to a slightly shorter time scale, looking over maybe a few million years Okay, at uh, these really short variability that lasts maybe a few tens of thousands of years. Okay, so this is zooming right in on the last 150,000 years. Um, so this is where we are now, uh, at the end of what we call the Holocene. Okay, you might kind of have heard the term Anthropocene also recently, which kind of isn't really shown on this plot, but it's kind of now. Um, and then going back in time, we've got the last glacial maximum. Okay, and this, this uh, period of warming is known as the last deglaciation, when we lost a lot of glaciers, sometimes called glacial terminations. Um, and if you go back in time, there, there, there's this, there's this short-term periodicity in climate uh, change, which lasts maybe 20,000 years. Uh, but we also have a long-term cycle, uh, which is of larger magnitude, and that looks like that, that's uh, like a, about 120-odd thousand year periodicity here. Okay? Um, and these, uh, we give isotope stage names. That's not really uh, important. I think I asked it on an exam question about four years ago and will not ask it again. It's, it's just remembering numbers. So um, how was the climate different at these times? So how is it different uh, here, these kind of minima of global climate of when it's cold to when it's hot? Um, so this is a map. Uh, so these are two sets of maps. The ones on the left are the ice thickness, uh, from a geophysical model, and uh, the ones on the uh, uh, left, no, right, no, these ones are temperature in the ocean. So the first thing you can see is that now we've got an ice sheet over Greenland that's maybe uh, two and a half uh, kilometers thick, which is thickest. Um, uh, but if you look back 21,000 years ago, uh, that ice sheet over Greenland was a lot bigger so it extended right out to the edges of the continental shelf on Greenland. Uh, but there was also other ice sheets that were much bigger. So all of Iceland was covered in ice. Almost, uh, well, all of, almost all of Canada, there were a few bits of Canada which kind of poked out, but like 99.7852, don't write that number down, percent of Canada was covered in ice. Quite a large portion of the United States. So New York was roughly where the ice margin was. Uh, and that was thick like five kilometers thick of ice. That's a lot of ice, okay? Um, uh, there were ice sheets over Scandinavia, um, the uh, uh, Russian continental margin, um, the British-Irish ice sheet here as well, which, you know, gives us all of our fantastic landscapes in Scotland. 
Um, so very different. There was, there was, so the amount of ice locked up on land meant that kind of on average global sea level was 125 metres lower than present. Okay? Um, if we look at the ocean, we can see uh, that the temperatures were a lot cooler than, than present. There were some bits of the ocean which were not cooler. Okay, so this is the thing, that climate is not just a single number, there's a spatial variability as well. Um, but so the planet was a lot cooler by kind of roughly about six degrees cooler, uh, and um, the, uh, there was a lot more ice. So what is driving these changes? Why, the, why these, I mean these are huge changes in climate, these are really dramatic changes in the Earth system over relatively short geological times. So it can't be driven by changes in weathering or long-term changes in, in, uh, in volcanism because those processes are just too slow. So, um, so what we're going to look at now is some of the, the well, the, the theory of orbital forcing that, that has been used to try and explain um, these, um, these changes. So this, uh, I guess it's quite nice to show that this is James Kroll, who was uh, an Edinburgh scientist, um, who, who I guess initially came up with the idea that changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun could change uh, the, the climate. This was worked on uh, more famously by Milutin Milankovic, uh, a Serbian mathematician, um, to come up with this theory of basically glacial cycles forced by orbital change. Okay? So there are, there are three main ways the Earth's orbit um, has, has changed, which will affect climate. Um, uh, I guess the first one, which we'll talk about, is tilt. Okay, so that's basically just where the Earth's axis of rotation is, how far from the, it is offset from the, um, the uh, I guess, orbit around the sun. There's a thing called precession, which is the way that the Earth's axis of tilt points. And there's this thing called eccentricity, which is the actual shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So we'll look at these in turn. And this is why I've got my, uh, my, lovely, uh, my lovely things here. So, um, so, so first of all, I will turn the lights out because, you know, it's 9 o'clock in the morning and nothing says keeping students awake like, uh, like lowering the lights. Um, I'm doing this so I can use my 50p lantern. And unfortunately, the, uh, yeah, the little light in it is pathetic. Um, so I'll just... So this... <coughs> That's the sun, okay? Just imagine that's the sun. And this, this is the earth. Um, so by uh, tilt, so as the, uh, as the earth, this is the earth, as the earth rotates around the sun, okay? Imagine that's you know, orbiting around the sun. Uh, its, its axis of rotation is tilted over, okay? And this is why we get seasons. So if the earth is tilted like this relative to the sun, uh, as the earth rotates, okay, this northern hemisphere will get a longer day than the southern hemisphere, which is kind of pointed away from the Earth, the, the sun, okay? But then as the, the Earth rotates around, the axis of rotation stays kind of fixed relative to, like, distant stars. So now it's kind of pointing away from... The northern hemisphere is pointing away from the, the sun. So this will be winter, okay? So um, the thing is that this angle of tilt sometimes called uh, obliquity. I'm not sure why. We can call it tilt, you can call it obliquity. I don't care, right? They're the same thing. Um, sometimes the... Well, so on average, I think it's tilted over about... What I think, does it say 20, 23 degrees or something like that? Ah, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, sometimes it's tilted over a little bit more, and sometimes it's tilted over a little bit less. So if it's tilted over a little bit more, then that makes the summers... Sorry, the, I, that makes the summers in the northern hemisphere warmer and kind of more summery, okay? So we'll get even longer days. I mean, if it's tilted over all the way like that, we get, it would be daylight all of the time. And then in winter, it would be perpetual nighttime, okay? Um, so uh, the more we tilt it over, the, the I guess, the, the warmer the summers are in the northern hemisphere, <laughs> And also, actually, in the southern hemisphere, when a southern hemisphere is summer, that's also going to be warm. So it makes the summers warmer and the winters cooler, irrespective of which hemisphere you're in. Okay? So it doesn't have any effect on the average temperature 
Okay? It only, or the average amount of solar radiation the, the Earth receives, it only changes the magnitude of the seasons. Okay? So the, the, sum, the extra radiation you get in the summer is cancelled out by the less you get in the winter. Okay? Um, but it does make the seasons kind of more seasony. Okay? Uh, and this is important because if you think about it, if you're trying to grow an ice sheet, if it's getting, if imagine that the planet is cooling down a little bit, you think, oh, right, we'll start growing an ice sheet. The thing that determines whether you can grow the ice, the ice sheet can get bigger or not, is does the snow that falls in winter melt in summer? Okay, so if it, if it, it can snow all it likes, a winter can be ridiculously cold, we can get loads of snow, but if it all melts away in winter, okay, then, uh, then you won't build up an ice sheet over time. So if you have high tilt, if, you, if your tilt is tilty mucked over, right like this, then you might have very cold winters, it might snow a lot, but you will um, have uh, lots of melting in the summer. So tilt kind of uh, inhibits ice sheet growth. If you have less tilt, then you can promote um, stuff. Um, and this has, uh, this basically, this angle that the Earth's axis kind of tilts over by seems to vary uh, on a, on a, at a period of 41,000 years. So every 41,000 years, it goes through a cycle of just tilting over and not tilting over. So the next uh, type of um, variability we're going to talk about is this thing called precession. So if something spins, like this spinning top, okay, um, you'll see that the axis of spin rotates around, like that. Okay? Yeah. So it's, um, it's kind of wobbling. And the Earth wobbles too. Okay? So, uh, so I have, I, when I did this demonstration here, I showed that the axis is always pointing in the same direction as we rotate around the Earth. Okay? So that's true in kind of one year, but over a, a time scale of 23 or 19,000 years, this will, the, the direction this points will be different. Okay? So sometimes it might be pointing right here, sometimes it might be here. Um, so let's have a, let's have a so that, thinking about the effect of this is slightly slightly more complicated. And there's this horrible diagram here. So this will require a bit of talking through. So what the, um, okay, so first of all, the sun is the, the, the uh, yellow, obviously, because it's the sun, although the sun is white. Uh, anyway, whatever. So the sun is uh, in the middle. Uh, the earth is the blue thing. And the arrows are the direction in which the axis of rotation of the earth is pointing. Okay? with the northern hemisphere being the tip of the arrow. Okay? So the, thing, the important thing, to, so if, if the Earth's orbit was circular, okay, this wouldn't matter at all which way it pointed. Right? But the Earth's rotation around the sun is not circular, it's slightly elliptical. Okay? So if you let's look at this top one up here. Okay? So uh, this, uh, the topmost uh, Earth up here, where it's the furthest away from the sun, now, the distance away from the sun doesn't matter for defining what season it is. What matters is where the axis of rotation is pointing. So it is pointing towards the, Earth, towards the sun at this point here. So this means that it's northern hemisphere, summer. Okay? Uh, it, also, that form means it's southern hemisphere, winter. Okay? Um, uh, and then as the... Um, Earth rotates around this elliptical orbit. You see the, the axis of rotation is still pointing in the same direction. Okay. Um, but, um, and then on a cycle of 20,000 years, this direction can change. So it points this way, then it points completely opposite way, then it points that way, and then it gets back to pointing the way it started with. And that, that wobbling of the Earth's kind of axis of rotation changes uh, on this, these, these cycles down here. Now, Let's have a think about what this means in terms of the magnitude of the seasons. So if it's well, like the, this image at the top here, where we're at summer, but we're far away from the, Earth, from the sun, that means that the summer here is going to be slightly cooler, okay, because we're further away from the sun. Whereas uh, winter, okay, although it's obviously colder because we're winter, we're... Uh, Pointed, the axis of rotation is pointed away from the um, uh, sun, so northern hemisphere winter, but we're closer. So this will make winter 
a little bit cool, uh, warmer than, than it would be otherwise. Uh, but in the southern hemisphere, okay, uh, this is summer. Okay? So that makes that we are then having a warmer summer. So this, this puts the, the, the effect of the seasons between the north and the southern hemisphere out of phase. So if, the, um, if we're in this situation at the top, where, uh, uh, where we're furthest away from the sun, uh, so that's called aphelion. Perihelion is when we're close to the sun. It doesn't, yeah, it's Greek. It literally is Greek to me. Anyway. Um, so at this, this, this time here, so the uh, summers in the northern hemisphere will be cooler, okay? But the summers in the, wind, in the southern hemisphere will be warmer. So it's an out of phase. It's cha still changing the magnitude of the seasons, but it's opposite for each hemisphere, okay? So, um, so we now think about the eccentricity, so the shape of the Earth's orbit. So you can see that the, it's been exaggerated in the, the images we're looking at before. This is what the shape of the Earth's orbit actually looks like. So the dots are a circle, and the solid lines are the actual shapes of the orbit. So you can see that Mars has a slightly more eccentric orbit than, uh, than the Earth. The Earth is very close to circular, but it's not quite circular. So um, over longer time scales of 9,531,000 years, the, um, the shape of the Earth's orbit around the sun changes from being slightly more uh, kind of oval, slightly more elliptical, uh, and then slightly more spherical. So that, that what this has is, this basically is an effect that moderates the effect of precession. Okay? So we have a very big, ellipt when our orbit is very elliptical, then precession kind of is magnified, uh, whereas when it's more circular, precession is kind of minimized. So when, if we had a perfectly circular orbit, precession would have no effect. Okay? Um, it also has uh, an effect of its kind of own in the, um, as the orbit, as, a, uh, well, as any object orbits any other object, uh, it will have an elliptical orbit um, because of physics. Um, and uh, when, you, when that object gets close to the, the thing it's orbiting around, uh, it moves faster, okay? And then when it's further away, it moves slower. This is Kepler's second law of um, planetary, you know, something or other, orbits. Um, so this, this ha does have an effect on the length of seasons. Um, so uh, although we might be kind of closer to the, the sun if we're at, at uh, perihelion here, um, so having either a warmer winter or a less uh, cold uh, winter or a warmer summer, depending on which way the Earth's uh, axis is pointing, um, that season will be shorter, okay, because we're swizzing through that bit of the orbit. Whereas the, the seasons over here, uh, when we're out on the long side of the orbit, will be longer. So eccentricity also changes the um, uh, length of seasons. That's important. Um, so we can have a look at these, what these changes actually do to the energy that's received at the Earth uh, at, uh, at uh, different kind of latitudes. So we can see these different, uh, these are the, the how precession changes through time. You can see it kind of it has actually uh, at least two different, uh, I think three different periodicities that are superimposed on each other. Obliquity is this mostly 41,000 year change, so it changes from being kind of... Uh, more tilted over to less tilted over, more tilted over, less tilted over. Eccentricity is kind of, you know, more circular, more elliptical, circular elliptical over long time scales. Now, this causes uh, very little change in the kind of average energy the whole planet receives, but it does change kind of where on the planet that energy is received. Um, so this, this yellow curve here is the... the the, the amount of energy that's received at 65 degrees north in s northern hemisphere summer. Okay? So if you look at the seasonal heating, which is what matters for if your ice sheet is going to grow or not, that, can, that changes, wiggles up and down. And the idea is that these wiggles going up and down kind of match what's happening on in the climate. Okay? So we think that these, these are forcing these. Now, that really doesn't look very convincing, does it? Okay, this yellow curve 
Okay, it doesn't really look like this black curve at the bottom. If I, if I told you that this is causing this, okay, I mean, you might not fight me over it, but uh, it's not a terribly convincing argument. So let's go and have a look at that argument in a little more detail. So the important thing is that it, I'm not claiming, or Milankovic or Kroll is not claiming that it's the, that this curve should look like this curve, because there are other things going on in the Earth system that can act to amplify any initial change, okay, these climate feedbacks. So if you look in detail, we can look at the timing of changes and see if that, that matches. So if I start to draw on some lines here of where we have big changes in climate. So I've put these red lines on, uh, I've tried to put them on these, these midpoints of the glacial termination. So going from glacial to deglacial. So this is basically when ice sheets kind of drastically melt, collapse into the ocean. And if you look at the orbital forcing at 65 degrees north, you can see that whenever we have one of these glacial terminations, that does seem to match up with where we have an increase in uh, heat arriving at that particular latitude. Okay? Now, there are lots of problems with this. It's not entirely true. I mean, they don't match up exactly when you look in detail. Um, if you can just about make out the timing of the most recent one isn't actually kind of at the middle of the deglaciation. It's a little bit later. Um, so the timing's not always kind of spot on. But we do see quite a strong relationship between the timing of, of climate changes and the, these maxima in orbital forcings. So it looks like the orbital changes are determining the time of climate change. Okay, they're giving climate a bit of a kick, okay? And then other things are going on in the climate system which are determining whether it's going to be uh, a big change or a little change, okay? And those things are the climate feedback, so an albedo feedback or a CO2 feedback. Um, yeah, so these, these, um, so these, these forcings are not really... Uh, big enough to describe all of this change. I'll, I'll put some posts in the, um, in the discussion forum. We can go over that in more detail then. But basically, the timing seems to matter. Um, and we can think about what the feedbacks might be. Okay? And the obvious one is an albedo feedback. So if you've got a an little initial, tiny little bit of uh, solar forcing that might be, maybe cause a little bit of, of melting of ice sheets, that will change the albedo. So it might mean that this, this snow line... Um, in, um, in this is the snow in this is snow in winter. This is snow in summer. Um, this might retreat a little bit more early in the season, or it might actually you know melt away a little bit more. Which means we change the albedo for that year. Okay, which means that we're going to be a little bit warmer, and that amplifies the initial change. It might be a CO2. It might if we get a little bit warmer, we might be able to put less CO2 into the ocean. So because it's less soluble, and then we could amplify the warming that way. Okay, so the feedbacks are usually involving these al albedo and emissivity or absorptivity of the atmosphere, whereas the initial forcing was actually a solar flux. And I guess this is where this, this model starts to break down because it's not the average solar flux that is important for the forcing. It's the solar flux at any at one particular latitude which is particularly sensitive to these climate feedbacks. Okay? So this is a case where using a really simple model like this doesn't really work for explaining how the climate works. We need, a, we need models that go into kind of at least kind of like latitudinal detail. Here is a zoomed in picture of that, that snow for, for no reason um, with some equations on it. Um, I can't remember what that, oh, I guess I guess I've already made that point, right? So changing the snowiness, having a bit more melting in summer will change the albedo, which will amplify the initial change. Um, and uh, I already mentioned briefly that CO2 uh, is, can also act as a feedback on these timescales. So when uh, the ocean is colder, okay, when the ocean is colder, you can dissolve more gas in the ocean. So this is a lager, which is chilled and has got lots of gas in it dissolved. Yeah, if you downed that, it would be very unpleasant. Uh, whereas a nice warm beer um, doesn't have any gas dissolved in it. I mean, that's because we haven't, like added CO2 to it to ruin a beer like they do with tenants. Um, but this happens in the ocean anyway. If we, if we warm up the ocean, less CO2 from the atmosphere will dissolve in the ocean. If we 
uh, cool the ocean down, more CO2 can dissolve in the ocean. So if we look at, uh, on the long time scale, we're looking at uh, the temperature of the planet as a proxy here in uh, oxygen isotopes uh, in blue, and the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere measured in those little bubbles uh, from ice cores in red. And you can see that there's a really close correlation between the two. Okay? And this is uh, showing that the, the temperature is changing, so the CO2 in the atmosphere is changing, and then that is acting as a positive feedback uh, on, on, on the climate and warming uh, further. Um, okay, so that's the, that's the orbital time scales. So the orbital time scales are important um, because they really determine kind of the long term uh, changes we're seeing uh, in the, um, in the uh, climate um, system. And they're quite nice because they show, enable us to show, figure out which parts of the planet are acting as feedbacks, which are acting as forcings. Um, but there are shorter term variabilities that are going on as well. Uh, so these are two ice core records, uh, one from the southern hemisphere down here and one from the northern hemisphere, uh, which is annoyingly in the bottom of the figure. Um, and again, we've got isotope proxies of temperature. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the exact isotope proxy doesn't matter. You can see different ice cores have got different absolute values for their isotopes, um, but the, the, the overall patterns are the same. Um, now, you can see this last kind of warming from 20,000 years ago to present, that's that last glacial termination. That's the last glacial maximum deglaciated to present to our nice kind of stable warm climate where uh, we kind of took over the planet and ruined it. Um, so these long-term changes can conceivably be driven by these orbital changes around the, uh, around the planet. Um, I'll turn the light back on so you don't fall asleep because I know I'm quite boring, but, you know, have some light to try and keep you awake. Um, and I can turn my phone light off. <laughs> hey, ho, ho. Um, oh, come on, turn off. Right. Um, but, so we've got long-term changes on here, okay, which might be orbitally forced over time scales of maybe up to 20 or down to 20,000 years, okay? Anything shorter than that can't be forced orbitally because there are no orbital changes that happen on that short time scale. So you can see, if you look at the Antarctic records, there are little warmings and coolings, warmings, coolings, that are of an order of maybe a couple of thousand years, <coughs> Okay? And in the northern hemisphere, there are similarly uh, periods of, of warming, cooling, warming, cooling, that are maybe bigger in magnitude, but of the same kind of time scale. Um, so what could be causing these? Okay, so we, if we zoom in okay, on a little bit of this record, okay, now I've got Greenland at the top and Antarctica at the bottom, just to confuse you. Um, uh, if we look at these in detail, when Antarctica is warmer, Greenland is cooler. Okay? Um, and in fact, when Antarctica is warmer, that, that's when we have this sudden change in, in the Greenland temperature. So the, the, the changes are not uh, at the same, they're out there, out of phase with each other, so they're opposite, and they're also different shapes. Okay? So in Greenland, we have a rapid warming, gradual cooling, rapid warming, gradual cooling, whereas in Antarctica, it's, it's more symmetrical. So the thing to notice here is now we're no longer talking about global climate. We're talking about regional climate, vari climate variability. So this can't really be f like an external uh, global change that's causing this. What's, what's most likely going on here is we're just redistributing heat around the planet. Okay? Sometimes it's in the northern hemisphere, okay? and then sometimes that heat is in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so uh, we're going to look a little bit about uh, one of the possible reasons for this. So this is, uh, this is the North Atlantic. Um, and one of the features we see in the North Atlantic is uh, uh, there are lots of icebergs that kind of like fall off uh, Greenland. Uh, and this, is, this is one of those icebergs. And if you, if you, can, uh, if you can see that the iceberg, iceberg in the background is kind of white, how you might think an iceberg looks. But in fact, quite a lot of icebergs are dirty and full of little bits of rock because okay, they've been grinding up kind of the rock as, they've been, as those glaciers have been flowing over the land. Um, 
And if you think back to the last glacial maximum, it wasn't just Greenland that was covered in this, this, this ice. It was Iceland, uh, northern uh, uh, Britain and Ireland, um, most of North America, all covered in these enormous ice sheets. And those would have been carving off uh, icebergs into the North Atlantic. And when they did that, okay, they're carrying these little rocks out into the ocean over here. Okay, and then what happens is they melt, and those little bits of rock fall out into the sediment. So we can see back in time, okay, periods when we have these uh, uh, basically little bits of rock out in the middle of the ocean where they shouldn't really be. Okay, and we see that over time we see the occurrence of these kind of what we call ice-rafted debris. Um, this, these are not kind of uniformly distributed through time. There are periods in time when we get lots of these, okay, and then we get none, and then we get lots, and then we get none. So there's a, basically a sporadic um, kind of sudden kind of, you know, spizz of these things out into the Atlantic. So uh, why would that happen? Okay, so we've already mentioned that there's this kind of flow of warm water from the, the tropical Atlantic up to these high latitudes, Okay, so this is driven by the rotation of the planet and the winds, and it basically piles up water over here, and we get this kind of current that flows uh, along the coast of the US up to Cape Hatteras, and then uh, zooms across up here. And that transports lots of heat, okay, up to this bit of the, the world up here. Then what happens is, uh, in the, the, when it's, once water gets up into the, uh, uh, the, the high latitudes up here, uh, it's losing lots of its heat, the atmosphere. Okay, water is evaporating, so that takes fresh water out of the ocean, uh, and it takes heat out of the ocean, that evaporation. That cools down the ocean, and it makes it more salty. So if you cool the water, it gets denser. If you make it more salty, that also makes it get denser. And that means that water is allowed to sink in this region up here, and also over here. It sinks to the bottom, okay, and then flows along the bottom down into the, the South Atlantic. Now, that act of sinking, okay, so basically makes space up in this region for more warm water to flow into it. So, you can think of it as the, the, this, this, this transport of warm water is being pushed from down here, from the Gulf Stream, being like spraying warm water up here, but it's also being pulled by this formation of deep water and this sinking of deep water down in the northern high latitudes. Um, and you can see this on a kind of a cross-section of the ocean here. So this is, uh, uh, this is us, this is Greenland, okay? Um, you can see that the surface currents kind of are bringing up warm water up to here, but then that water sinks down to the bottom, okay, and forms this deep kind of overturning circulation. So if we look at what, how that might affect the climate, if this, this conveyor of warm water is uh, strong, that's transporting heat from down here to up here. So it'll make this bit of the ocean warm, this bit cold. If it's weaker, okay, then if this flow of water is weaker, then it'll be cold up here and warm down here. So the strength of this ocean circulation could cause there to be an antiphasing between the hemispheres in terms of the temperature. Okay, so this is what we're seeing. So we're seeing uh, kind of when it's warm down here, okay, we have weak circulation up here, which means it's cold. Uh, less heat is being transported up to the north. So what could cause the ocean circulation to change? So if you think about it in terms of what's actually driving it, this sinking is being driven by fluxes of heat and fluxes of fresh water. So if we have strong northwards flow, okay, we're going to put lots of heat into the atmosphere. We're going to basically increase uh, the amount of uh, kind of snow going on to here. Okay, that's going to um, make this water here dense because it's got lost heat and it's lost uh, uh, fresh water, so it's become salty, and that will cause um, this overturning to be quite strong. Now, what would happen if this, we, we increase this arrow here? It's going to ultimately mean that we're adding more mass to the ice sheet. That's going to make it flow into the ocean faster. Okay, we're going to increase the hydrological cycle here. And if we increase freshwater runoff into this region, okay, then that will make the, the salinity or the amount of salt in the water lower because we're basically diluting it with freshwater, which make it, make it less likely to sink. And if it's less likely to sink, 
then we might slow down this overturning circulation. If we slow down this overturning circulation, that means that we're now no longer transporting this heat up to here, so it'll cool down. But that then means we are reducing this. So this will, this hydrological cycle will slow down, which then means that we're starting to then have less uh, meltwater runoff, which means that over time, this region will start to become more salty, and then we'll flip back to this state. Okay? So there's this idea that just this, 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 this system can self-oscillate between having